and present, present today from the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, which is a network of 15 independent national civil liberties and human rights organizations from around the world who are gathered here in Toronto to meet and discuss the important work that we do. Um, I'd also like to welcome our participants from across Canada on this webinar, um, both from across Canada and also from some of the INCLO countries who have joined us online to hear this amazing group of panelists share their experiences and their thoughts regarding facial recognition technology. But before we go further, I'd like to start our time today with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that many of us are joining from different places in Canada and around the world today, and we will not be able to acknowledge all the Indigenous people our participants are sitting on. We recognize... I'm sorry, my computer is driving me insane. That being said, we do want to acknowledge the land on which this group of people in this room are currently sitting. Um, and for the people that are here, we are in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. In the spirit of recon reconciliation, we acknowledge and express our gratitude that we live and work today on the land that Indigenous peoples have lived on and taken care of since time immemorial. We're honored to be in this space at this time. Turning to today's topic, facial recognition. Facial recognition is a type of biometric technology that uses artificial intelligence to identify individuals through their facial features. It works by creating templates, kind of maps, of key facial features that allow comparisons between li live and stored biometric templates. You can think of it like a facial fingerprint. It's an identifier that's based on your body that is unique to you. Here in Canada, we lack adequate legislation to fully protect our faces, or more broadly, any highly sensitive personal biometric information. That's something that emerged very clearly during a recent scandal here, which was duplicated in some of the other countries represented here today when police forces were revealed to be using a facial recognition tool produced by a company called Clearview AI, a tool which was very definitively declared by our privacy commissioner here in Canada as illegal. CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, has been working very actively to advocate for the kinds of regulatory protections that it's so clear we lack because we see the very real risks to rights and freedoms that this technology raises, not just to our privacy, but to those rights that privacy supports and enables, including equality rights, particularly with this technology, known to be less accurate on faces that are black or brown or female or young. In other words, any faces other than those that are white and male. Um, it affects our rights to freedom of expression and association because those rights are chilled or thwarted when state bodies cannot just watch us as we go about our daily business, but identify us, in us to a time and place. So today we are so grateful to be able to draw on the expertise and the experiences of a truly exciting panel representing four of our INCLO partners in order to learn from them um, and help us as a civil liberties organization in Canada and perhaps you as individuals, participants in the audience, think through the implications of this technology and the actions that we might take alone or together. So joining me today in alphabetical order, but not seating order, Emmanuel Andrews, here to, my, here to my immediate left, who's the policy and campaigns manager at Liberty in the United Kingdom. To her left, we have Gil Ganmore, who is a lawyer and director of the Civil and Social Rights Unit at the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. Um, at the far end, we have Manuel Tufro, director of the Violence and Security Group. And I'm going to absolutely butcher this name in Spanish, but in honor of Manuel, who has agreed to do this panel in English, not his first language, I'm going to make a valiant attempt. The <laughs> Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales or cells, <laughs> and to my immediate right, Ben Wisner, lawyer and director of the Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project at the American Civil Liberties Union. So as we, as we 
turn now to our panel conversation, I would like to remind our audience that you are welcome to ask questions in the Q&A interface as that's a part of your webinar screen as they arise. We will spend some time at the end of our session answering those questions, but you don't have to wait for the end of our conversation to put them in the queue. We also want to let you know as a group that's um, sensitive to issues of privacy and surveillance that this webinar is being recorded. So please take that into account when you're considering the kind of information that you choose to share in those question and, a, question and answer fields. Um, so to start the conversation, I'm going to turn to my right to Ben and ask him to kick off the conversation by telling me about a key project or an initiative or a legal case that you're working on that has to do with facial recognition technology. Thanks, Brenda, and thanks to everyone for joining this webinar. Um, and before I get to the specific case, um, I want to say that the technology already exists to end public anonymity. Um, imagine walking through city streets and being stopped every 100 meters by a police checkpoint and having to turn over your identification. Um, the infrastructure for making this happen with cameras, with facial recognition linked to databases of our identities already exists. And the only thing preventing that kind of digital checkpoint society from being created uh, is law and policy uh, and the work that we'll do to prevent um, that kind of dystopian picture from becoming the reality. Um, I think there's really, in, in a way, two major problems with facial technology that are somewhat in tension with each other, and I'm going to mention both and then talk about a case. Um, the first is that, as you said in your lead-in, um, this is a technology that has had a disparate impact, uh, in particular, a racially disparate impact, uh, in that it has been proven to be less accurate um, for faces that are outside the dominant minority of the training sets, meaning white and male. Uh, that has led in the U.S. to cases of uh, mistaken arrests where uh, people were actually handcuffed in front of their children and taken off to jail because uh, of a mistake with facial recognition. We represent uh, a black man in Michigan named Robert Williams who had this occur. Uh, and a lot of work needs to be done um, to uh, highlight these cases, to address these kinds of inequalities, and I think really to, to make people understand the harms that these technologies can create. Um, but I wouldn't want us to focus solely on the ineffectiveness of facial recognition, because I can tell you that these companies have been working day and night uh, to fix them. Uh, and are getting better and better and better uh, at identifying all kinds of faces um, and that um, some of us uh, as uh, offended and disgusted um, as we are at the racial inequalities that the technology has created um, are at least as worried uh, about what's going to happen once those problems have been fixed uh, and once we have a technology that is accurate more than 99% of the time um, at identifying us. And we'll talk about the Clearview AI case um, a little bit uh, later on, but you know that that is a company that uh, essentially respects no boundaries uh, and uh, is trying to, to you know, essentially make the norm um, the kind of surveillance activities that larger companies have been too nervous uh, about doing. We didn't need Clearview AI to create this capability uh, of letting every police officer identify every face. Um, Facebook and Google could have done this 10 years ago, um, but, but they didn't because they were worried about public backlash. Um, we now have small companies that are emerging that, that don't have the same commitments to customers, aren't as worried about regulators, uh, and are really pushing the boundaries here to, to move closer to the world that I described in my introduction. Thanks, Ben. Actually, I'm going to ask you to pass the mic now down to Manuel, and if you'd like to make a bit of an opening statement or start talking about one of your key projects or initiatives. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Brenda. Hi, everyone. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the CCLA for the invitation. As Brenda said, English is not my first or even my second language, so maybe at some point I'll be not so fluent or maybe I should go back to my notes. I hope you, you will excuse me. 
Uh, as Brenda said, uh, I'm part of a human rights organization in, in Argentina. Uh, we work with a very broad agenda, maybe too broad, uh, but um, security policies are a key issue of, for us since uh, a couple of decades, and that's how we came across uh, facial recognition technology, which is what we are going to discuss today. I'd like to make uh, a brief comment uh, on terminology, uh, even if English is not my first language. <laughs> When we did the translation to Spanish of the INCLOS report on FRT stories from around the world, we decided to talk about facial recognition systems and not technologies. Uh, because we all understand that technology per se, I mean softwares, algorithms, search engines, uh, they are a key component of broader systems or arrangements of political and bureaucratic practices and regulations and pre-existing databases in which these technologies are embedded. Um, and I am highlighting this because in Argentina, many of the problems we detected are not really uh, hardcore technology problems, but rather problems in other parts of this complex systems or arrangements. Of course, this does not mean that technology has not problems, but we don't know which problems are those because in Argentina, we couldn't access to the information about the technology. We don't know which software the government is using, at least at the local level. Uh, and even in the context of a lawsuit that I will comment uh, today, the authorities would not give us detailed information about the technology they are using. So we are uh, talking about facial recognition systems to highlight this, this problem too. We've been working since 2019 in a litigation against the implementation of the facial recognition system in the Buenos Aires city. We've been carrying this case together with a sort of uh, hackers organization called ODIA, which means hate in Spanish and also stands for the Argentinian Observatory of Informatic Rights. And we started uh, this litigation focusing on the general problems that uh, research on FRT around the world has uh, repeatedly pointed out. I mean, the risks of mistakes and wrongful, uh, wrongful identifications, racial and et ethnical biases, etc. But as the judge gathered more information, it was clear that the oversight and the accountability systems regarding this uh, facial recognition system were non-existent. So last year in September, the judge ruled that the facial recognition system in Buenos Aires City is unconstitutional and it was suspended. And the judge said that it had been implemented without complying with the legal provisions for the protection of the constitutional rights of the inhabitants of the city. So the decision, which is a good decision for us, is not centered on the, on the facial recognition technology, but in the fact that it was uh, prematurely implemented and deployed in what I would call precarious conditions regarding the respect of individual rights. So the local government appealed this decision and now we are waiting for the decision of the High Court of Justice of the Buenos Aires City. And this is a moment of like a bit of tension in our organization, uh, the tension between lawyers and researchers. I don't know if, if you're familiar with this in your own organizations. I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but lawyers are saying now uh, we won this case. The judge ruled in our favor, so we don't need to go deeper on knowing about this technology. That could even be counterproductive for the litigation strategy. But we want to know more about the software. We want to know which software it is, how does it work, uh, because this judicial decision uh, leaves the door open. It says that with an adequate oversight system, facial recognition technology could be in use again. So that is a discussion we're having now in, in our organization. Uh, we also know in another level that the federal government has a Russian software called Luna. I don't know if anyone heard about it. We know they are using it for criminal investigation and not as far as we know for surveillance, but we couldn't gather more information about it neither. So I would leave it here now and maybe then we can complete.
And I think that's a really good transition to have Emmanuel speak next, uh, because Liberty, the organization she belongs to, um, conducted, I think, the very first litigation uh, challenging facial recognition. Um, there's some commonalities there with the situation Manuel, Manuel is describing. So, Emmanuel, <laughs> I've got a Manuel Emmanuel sandwich here, and I'm trying to be very careful to pronounce first syllables. <laughs> Emmanuel, um, if you'd like to make a little bit of an opening statement um, and tell us about a key project or initiative that you're working on. Thank you, Brenda, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I will talk about the legal challenge that Liberty uh, won. Uh, in back in 2020 but I uh, I'll save that for some of the other questions I think um, so just to start I wanted to give a quick overview of the landscape of facial recognition in the UK at the moment um, so it's being deployed and used in a vast array of different contexts and situations uh, from supermarkets using it to enforce blacklists on individuals entering their stores. Schools have come under fire for deploying it against children purchasing lunch. Um, we've seen uh, the adoption of search identification tools, which one developer boasted on their website was offering a dangerous superpower from the world of science fiction, which could not be closer to the truth. Um, and of course, police use. Um, so from the potential use of live facial recognition with body worn camera to retrospective facial recognition, which turns essentially every photo or video into a possible surveillance tool as well as operator initiated facial recognition. So police officers using a mobile phone app um, with facial recognition embedded uh, to facial recognition watches that are used uh, to monitor individuals subject to immigration control. So there's, you know, so many different ways in which institutions beyond the police are using it. Uh, I think Liberty's main concern at the moment is police use, and that's definitely our main focus. Uh, and we're particularly concerned about police use of facial recognition at protest. Um, we were talking earlier in the day about the raft of, of new protest legislation that's been passed or due to be passed at the moment. And included within that legislation is a massive expansion of uh, the potential to people for people to be criminalized for things that they wouldn't have previously been criminalized for, um, including the use of new civil orders that have criminalizing penalties if you breach any of the conditions attached to them. Um, and a good example, a good kind of uh, um, reference point for this is, is the use of football banning orders. So banning particular people from football uh, matches. And we know that the police are using it and have used it at football matches to, to to uh, certainly to capture whether people are breaching um, these orders. So we wouldn't be surprised if police, if they're not already using it to capture people uh, at protests and to surveil protesters and activists and uh, advocates. And particularly in, in given the increasing uh, raft of new oppressive legislation against protest, uh, against our ability to protest, that the police will use that as an opportunity to, to expand the context within which they're, they're using it. And the UK has a really dark history when it comes to um, uh, covert human intelligence, so spies, um, to, to, using spies to integrate into political activism and, and social justice movements. So that is a particularly um, yeah, a particularly uh, concerning area that we're focusing on at the moment. Um, I mentioned the case that, that Liberty led uh, back in 2020, um, and that was also a, a protest case. Um, Ed Bridges, the, the uh, claimant, uh, had been protesting outside an arms fair, uh, and it was, it was in that case that um, the Court of Appeal ruled uh, South Wales police use of facial recognition un unlawful, which I will talk a little bit more about uh, in a little. Um, but I was also going to say that in terms of, so in addition to the kind of threats to protest and, and our concerns around facial recognition use at protests, to kind of be a bit positive, um, we have just seen a local council in London pass a moratorium on facial recognition, which is fantastic. It was literally a month, a couple of months ago. Um, and this was the borough of Newham, which was 
A, one of the first places that facial recognition was ever trialed in, in London and in the UK. And B, it's one of the most ethnically diverse places in, in London. So, you know, on the one hand, the fact that it was deployed in a predominantly black area raises alarm bells about it being deployed against marginalized communities and the ways in which police will use technology to oppress black communities in particular. But it also is an incredible win that the local council did pass a moratorium banning it. Um, so I think that also, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later as well, but there are so many different routes for us to affect change on this area. Um, and I think one, one of those routes for us will be increasingly looking at local routes because as I'm sure many people know, our government is in increasingly authoritarian and our opposition party is uh, less, uh, provides less uh, comfort in, in <laughs> I'm trying to be really diplomatic. Um, yeah, our, 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 gov our current government is really authoritarian and our opposition party, to be frank, is little better. So I think looking at, yeah, di different ways that we can oppose this technology is, is and more creative ways is uh, becoming especially more urgent. That was a really great list of expanded list of terrifying ways this technology can be used. Do you have anything to add to that list, Gil? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, you know, usually when we are talking about these technologies or systems um, of facial recognition, we try to distinguish between a democ democracies and countries that are not democracies. And uh, we at, uh, at the Association for Civil Rights in Israel uh, have the privilege of having both. Um, in one context is the, our work uh, within Israel, uh, which is, you can say, a democracy. We are struggling with that at the moment, but it's still a democracy. We have a constitutional right to privacy. Uh, and if the police or other law enforcement agency wants to use facial recognition, there are some, a lot of limits about it. It has to be accordance to a specific law, it needs to be proportional, and so on. And therefore, we were until now able to stop the police from using facial recognition. But we also have in our backyard, uh, the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, which is a territory that is occupied by Israeli for more than 50 years. And the Palestinians who are living there are living under the Israeli military, under uh, military regime, under occupation. And this is not a democracy. This is a whole different uh, environment and legal environment where there is no um, uh, norms that we are usually recognizing in, in, in a democracy. There is no right of, uh, of privacy that is being enforced in any way. And therefore, this is an excellent kind of a, a lab for the authorities to try new uh, surveillance technologies. And one of these technologies is uh, a facial recognition te technologies that it's called the Blue Wolf uh, system. Um, it was never introduced officially by anyone. We just found out about it from talking to people on, uh, on, the, on the ground, from evidence of ex-soldiers that were uh, asked to use this uh, this uh, system, uh, evidence that were collected by uh, our colleagues in uh, Breaking the Silence, which is an organization of ex-soldiers that are trying to fight occupation. And the system is work uh, <clears throat> in a way that uh, the soldiers are request, requested by, their, uh, uh, by the army to collect as many photos, identified photos of Palestinians at any age, children, uh, men, women, elderly. Um, and these photos are uh, taken and, and put into a photo bank of 
all the Palestinians. They started in, a, in one city in Hebron, and now they are expanding it to the entire West Bank. And then they put a lot of cameras that can uh, recognize people based on their biometric facial data. And they use the camera to just identify people in public spaces uh, when they um, and, um, um, walking near a check post or um, in any place that they just want to have a temporary check post. And the soldiers have this kind of, uh, of a, a, a cellular app. And this app tells the soldier if the person is either green, uh, orange, or red. Green means that uh, he was identified and is okay. The, he can, he, he can uh, go uh, and is not needed for anything. Orange is that this person is needed for more questioning. And then they detain the person until they get further uh, orders. And red means that this person needs to be arrested and taken to, to the police or to the uh, army. And uh, so I think that if we, we are now looking into this, uh, this system and the way it's being used in the, in the West Bank, and I think this is kind of a frightening uh, mirror that can, can reflect how the reality will be when these systems will be uh, part of our life. And, and the army is... Uh, actually using this Orwellian uh, language, and they say that no, that this system is not against the population, but it's for the population, it's gonna help the population because if you are recognized and you are green, you're free to go. So actually we are trying to help the innocent people, but obviously if we are talking about the, the Palestinian in the occupied territory, many of them are labeled as a risk for so many people, even just because they have family ties for someone who is um, under investigation or anything. So, uh, and another thing that is uh, very alarming is that it has a very serious chilling effect on the lives of Palestinians, which are already before this technology was under a lot of uh, surveillance and, and pressure from the army. Um, just one example, the army is using um, uh, people that they know that they are uh, in the closet, as, like LGBT that are in the closet, to force them to cooperate and give them information. So just imagine when somebody is uh, going to a place where is, which is known to be a place for uh, LGBT community uh, meetings, and there is a facial recognition camera in this place recognizing all the people that are coming there. This is a serious threat for their freedom and their ability to exist in this area. I hope I depressed you enough. <laughs> Thank you. More than depressed, I think we can all be warned. Here in Canada, we sometimes think um, that it can't happen here. And one of the things that we can draw from these examples is that across a wide range of countries with a wide range of types of government, inevitably, whenever this technology comes into play, the same kinds of risks um, run as a common thread, uh, regardless of jurisdiction. Um, so, I mean, here in Canada, I mentioned that we found out that Clearview AI was being used by police, and the fact of that really highlighted that we have gaps in our laws when it comes to regulating this technology. So my next question for the panel is, have you had a similar experience, either with a Clearview, either with Clearview itself, with another specific product? And how did you find that your laws uh, did or did not um, stand up to the test of regulating that, that invasive surveillance? And I am going to start with Manuel this time. Well, when the facial recognition system was approved in 2019 in Buenos Aires City, 
It was presented as a tool for searching for fugitives and people with arrest orders uh, through the use of CCTV cameras in public spaces. And the ministerial order that created this system also ordered the creation of a special legislative commission for oversight. Of course, this was nothing but a formal concession, I would say, and the commission never existed. Uh, the facial recognition system was implemented with what I would call an automatic consensus, much like uh, what happened with CCTV in previous decades. And the legal framework was truly never intended to regulate its use. It is, in fact, that's the ground for the uh, judicial decision of suspending the facial recognition system. So the question is, in this absence of oversight, uh, what happened with the practices of security forces? Uh, well, fashion recognition system was intended to work um, crossing data between a database of fugitive and wanted people, which consists maybe in 30 to 40,000 names, and the biometric data gathered by the National Identity Database in, in Argentina. But when the judge asked this National Identity Database how many individual consultations received from the Buenos Aires government, it turned out that the government made consultations about more than 7 million people, not those 30 or 40,000 fugitives. So clearly the Buenos Aires police and maybe other offices were accessing that biometric data for other purposes entirely different, entirely different than searching for fugitive. And to this day, we don't know exactly how and why they access data for that 7 million people. Uh, so uh, long story short, no, the legal framework didn't stood up to the test, but uh, then again, it wasn't a, a proper legal framework, but rather like a, a blank check of the implementation of FRS. Uh, you know, I realize we both mentioned Clearview AI, and we may not have adequately explained what that company is and what it does. Um, but Clearview AI is a facial recognition startup um, that scraped the internet for billions and billions of photographs. These were photographs that people had posted uh, to social media sites. And even though those social media sites say, you're not supposed to come onto our sites and scrape them for photographs. Um, they didn't take a lot of steps to prevent a company like Clearview from doing that. And then Clearview uh, developed uh, a sophisticated facial recognition algorithm that allowed their customers, who are principally police organizations, to submit to Clearview any kind of photo. It could be a still photo from a surveillance camera, basically any photo, uh, and then have Clearview return to them um, dozens, hundreds of photos of that person that identify the person because they also scraped all of the information from these public um, social media sites. So what it essentially meant was that if you give this company um, a photo of anybody uh, who's watching this right now, um, they're going to be able to say with a very, very high degree of accuracy um, who you are and also link to other information of yours. Now, we didn't know this company existed. And, the, and this is the real legal challenge. The way we found out this company existed is that a anti-surveillance advocate in Chicago was doing Public Record Act requests uh, and a Illinois police agency accidentally sent him a legal memo that had been prepared by a very prominent American lawyer explaining why everything that Clearview AI did was legal and protected by the Constitution. Um, he had never heard of the company, was stunned by what he read gave that memo to a reporter from the New York Times who then spent the better part of a year um, figuring out for the rest of us uh, what this company was up to. And their business model essentially was to make Clearview AI available to lots of individual police officers all around the United States without even telling their superiors, without going through any kind of procurement process at all, but put it into the hands of police so that they could be dazzled by how effective it was, and then advocate uh, to their bosses um, to uh, retain Clearview and to, to give them money. It wasn't originally only intended for police officers. They hoped that private companies would be able to use this. They were handing out the app to some of their investors. Uh, one of their billionaire 
investors use the app to identify the men that his daughter uh, were bringing around and get in, get background information about them. So this really was, um, uh, you know, this way to end privacy uh, as as we know it, and and only because of this, um, you know, mistake did it come to light in a way that allowed, um, you know, us in the U.S. to to bring a legal challenge. Uh, and then there have been other legal challenges around the world. And, and, and this is something I want to highlight here, which is that at least in the United States, um, typically law enforcement agencies um, are already using a surveillance technology for years before we have the chance to actually challenge it legally. So they're not waiting for a legislation to say, um, you're now authorized to use facial recognition. They use facial recognition until either a legislature or a court tells them they can't. Um, and they've been very um, clever about how they use it, particularly in criminal cases. Um, so if they were presenting the results of facial recognition um, algorithm tests in court routinely, we'd have an opportunity to come at it and to, and to do discovery and to find out how it's being used. Um, but instead, they usually use facial recognition to identify their suspect and then find other information before they go to a court for a warrant. And we never see any mention in a criminal trial that facial recognition was used at all. It all happened in the early investigatory stages, and it doesn't turn up uh, in any way that would allow us to see if there are constitutional limitations on how it can be used uh, in criminal cases. Uh, and I'll just add that, that, and I think this is probably happening in some of our societies, one of the debates among privacy advocates is you know, is it time now for us to go into legislatures and parliaments and legislate all of the possible restrictions and use cases, or do we still have a chance, as we heard, um, it occurred in London and has happened in a few cities in the U.S., um, to get communities to ban law enforcement use of this technology? And I will say um, we're seeing both approaches um, in the United States, um, but I think everyone recognizes that uh, before long we're going to have to engage um, in a debate that distinguishes different kinds of uses of facial recognition. The, 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 the real, um, you know, darkest scenario um, is, you know, something that looks a lot like the way it would be used in Western China, um, where, where the entire infrastructure of CCTV cameras um, now has this kind of identifying technology that can be used in real time. Um, we know that um, uh, in the United States, these capabilities are being investigated by law enforcement and intelligence agencies, but, but have not been rolled out in that sense. And then there are other kinds of uses of facial <laughs> recognition te technology that bother us a lot, but where we think that um, with some kinds of warrant requirements, with some kinds of, um, you know, restraints on how the information can be used, that will be better than, than what we have now, which is um, essentially, uh, we don't know. We don't know what the cops are doing. That's all ringing very true in the Canadian context, where we are now starting to see facial recognition technology appear in cases um, as part of disclosure before lower courts to be mentioned in judgments. And that's something that the CCLA is looking at, is can we find those cases? Can we identify how courts are dealing with this technology as a sort of precursor to thinking through, you know, is there, is there an opportunity to litigate? And how can that also feed into our policy work? Um, but I also think it's fascinating that you're, that you identify, you know, the concerns across a spectrum of uses. We've heard about a spectrum of uses, um, already this evening, um, because we're having those same kinds of conversations here in Canada, um, in part due to the backlash against the Clearview case, we now have police forces in Canada saying, well, so We'll just go back to the uncontroversial use of facial recognition where we check um, photos from crime scenes against our own mugshot databases. Um, and what that sort of characterization of that use of facial recognition technology as, as uncontroversial does is skip over the entire legacy of systemic racism that is, lies beneath who gets surveilled, who gets arrested, who gets charged in our societies, which here in Toronto, Canada, we have very good data to suggest are predominantly people who are black and people who are indigenous 
and people who are homeless. So we know that even in what, uh, you know, a rhetorically uncontroversial use, according to our law enforcement agencies, um, there are fundamental problems in the ways that the data sets have been created um, that render even that kind of use deeply problematic. Um, which feels like a good transition to go back to Emmanuel. And if you could tell us um, one of the cases, or whether or not, um, as you work through this, um, you found that the laws that you have in place are, are successful or unsuccessful in dealing with that wide spectrum of risks that you identified. Yeah, definitely. So uh, just to quickly pick up on the Clearview AI situation, we also have been, Clearview AI in the UK has also been the subject of intense scrutiny um, for the exact, you know, exact, the exact same reasons. Um, and the Information Commissioner's Office, so our kind of data protection ombudsman in the UK, fined Clearview AI for uh, what it was doing, so scraping the internet um, and passing that uh, information on to police forces. And, and just to give an example of the ways in which these startups work, they are really insidious. So, for example, in the UK, we know that they will go to like police force fairs and literally hand out the technology for free and say, oh, just trial this. And, you know, that it's a, it's a really... Um, yeah, the way that they are promoting their technology is 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 it's very uh, intense. Um, but to answer the question of uh, yeah, what kind of laws or policies we have to facilitate or limit police use of facial recognition, um, the Clearview AI example is a good example of you know right now we have good data protection laws, but that is subject to change. Uh, we've got more legislation going through at the moment that might really restrict the Information Commissioner Office, Commissioner office uh, powers and role. So there's no saying that if this a similar situation would happen again, that you know we would have the same kind of enforcement mechanism uh, and, and uh, um, hefty fines um, imposed on Clearview. But it is also a good example of the patchwork of legislation that we have. Um, so, and this is actually the patchwork of legislation is what, until the Bridges case, uh, was what the police, the government, the courts were saying that uh, the police were able, were saying was why the police were able to use the technology um, and that it was adequately uh, regulated by existing statutory provisions. Um, and other, and other legislation. So just to give an example of what that legislation looks like and which we argue and that which eventually the courts found was not the case, they were relying on things such as their police common law powers, um, Data Protection Act for the biometrics and personal data aspects, uh, for the equalities issues, the Equality Act, uh, the Human Rights Aspect, the Human Rights Act, um, and other legislation to cover things like the covert use of facial recognition, so the regulation of Investiga Investigatory Powers Act um, and the Protection of Freedoms Act for the CCTV camera use. Um, and so it was our argument and also the Court of Appeal found in Bridges to agree that this existing legal framework was, as they said, fundamentally deficient. So that's really positive, obviously. Um, it means that the combination of these standards was not sufficient governance. Um, but uh, we would obviously also argue that uh, no, there is no governance that would ever be able to mitigate for the rights risks of facial recognition. And I think that's a really important distinction because the courts in the court in Bridges, the Court of Appeal, identified that whilst the existing legal framework wasn't sufficient, um, what we've seen is that police and the government have started to try and fill those gaps. So, for example, we've seen surveillance camera commissioner guidance. Uh, we've seen codes of practice. Um, we've seen uh, the College of Policing has issued more guidance on facial recognition. So they're definitely taking note of the judgment and trying to fill in the gaps that where the court said it wasn't sufficient. So ultimately, the police are considering not whether we should use facial recognition, but how can we use it? <clears throat> um, and trying to bring it into alignment with the law post bridges. And I think the lesson here, and I and we will also hopefully go into some of the, you know, what what can we learn from each other in this uh, in the fight against this technology, but the lesson here is 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 really the limits of strategic litigation. 
we were always aware that, you know, we weren't going to be able to win the political argument in a court, in a courtroom. Um, and the courts and, you know, using the law often only helps once the, the, the infringement has been made. Um, so I think that's just a really important takeaway that the law has to continue to be the floor and not the ceiling, particularly because facial recognition is already in, in widespread use. So for, our, for us, our primary concern is, is that not having an explicit legal basis is problematic. Like we, st you know, we still agree and we're obviously really proud of the win in Bridges because it identified that the existing legal framework wasn't good enough. Um, and that's obviously a problem because it means, you know, as we've identified, the police just use it however they want. Um, they use it to, uh, yeah, they, as they, they, they will say, they will allege that they use it to catch particular people, terrorists, etc., which we also are really critical of because as we've you know, already spoken about, the concept of crime and the con concept of a lot of these things is, is heavily racialized, it's heavily classed. Um, so it's not as black and white as, you know, you can just use it to catch these people. Um, but obviously the fact that they can use it however they want is problematic. But Liberty's perspective is that it will, the harms of facial recognition can never actually be mitigated for. Um, and this is especially true in light of what I spoke about earlier with respect to this the UK government's creeping authoritarianism. It's not even creeping anymore. It's very blatant. Um, but it's really not difficult to see who the use of this technology will continue to fall upon um, in, you know, various moral panics that this government has. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I'll pass over to you. Regime does or does not. Well, I... As I said before, uh, so far, stop uh, using facial recognition. The reason was that we caught the, caught the police using another system, LPR system, license plate recognition, which records automatically the movements of cars in Israel. And we filed a petition to the High Court of Justice in Israel saying that this is illegal and they cannot use such a such a system based on the general authority of the police they need a specific authorization to use such a mass uh, uh, surveillance uh, system and the court uh, sided with us so when the police wanted to start using facial recognition and we know that they already have the system because um in the uh, last um, Pride Parade in Jerusalem, the police officially asked the Attorney General to start using facial recognition during the parade um, in order uh, to protect the, the um, people that were attending the parade. And the Attorney General said no, because uh, I think it's because of our case uh, against uh, the use of LPR system. Um, but I think Ben was talking about uh, about should we ban try to ban uh, this technology or what can we do and I mean my my basic approach is that I mean if we if we could convince the the government the, and the police and the other agencies that we should uh, continue without this technology then that would be the best if we could ban the technology that would be the best but it's I don't think it's realistic, uh, and I think that we we already see that a lot of uh, poli uh, police and law uh, enforcement agencies around the the world, and also in the in in the democratic world, are already using uh, facial recognition uh, systems. Um, so what we can do, we can I think we should follow three principles. First, we should try to stop this pattern that we see, and, and Ben also told, talked about it before, the pattern that these uh, technologies are being employed secretly by these law enforcement agencies without anybody knowing about it, without public discourse, without any transparency. That's the first thing that we need to do is to move the discourse from the police to the uh, political system. And we can do it using litigation because we can 
for example, saying that there is no uh, sufficient uh, legal basis or, and st stuff like that. And that's usually work uh, to shift the issue to the, to the parliament and then we can have a public debate and then we can talk about, and this is the second uh, uh, principle about proportionality. And I think this is important to try to address the more severe effect of this technology and not just oppose it as, as, as a whole. For example, it's, it's a different um, if we use facial recognition to just recognize people on a watch list that is carefully um, uh, selected by authorized uh, people with maybe with a judicial review or something like that and or if we are using the technology to just identify everybody that is working in the city square or something like that or it's different if we are talking about um, severe crimes or we are talking about just you know regular crimes that maybe this technology should not be used uh, to solve just regular crimes and this is the questions that we we should try to to raise and to limit the effect of the technology and the third principle is uh, oversight and i think that the traditional oversight system that we had for uh, for the police uh, are not good enough for the new technologies we need something else we cannot um, keep on going with the traditional system of police going to a judge, get a warrant, and then that's fine. I mean, there's just some supervision, or maybe later they will just move the give give some statistic to somebody in the that is oversighting the, the police. It's not enough. I think that we with this kind of new technologies that can. Uh, so well, so many people uh, uh, easily. Uh, we need to think about independent uh, bodies that can oversight the, the law enforcement agencies that will have independent status that will have power to get the, all the information they need to see what's actually the police is doing with this with these technologies and, and I think that maybe can help reduce some of our fears from from these technologies the last question for the panel um, which is what is your advice for us here in Canada uh, we are facing a really important moment in this country from a policy perspective in that we have our private sector privacy law uh, being revised right now, currently in second reading before our parliament. Um, we're told that another, our public sector, federal public sector law will soon be revised. And we also have a new artificial intelligence and data act on the table again before, before our parliament. Um, so taking into account that we may here have a, an important window to advocate for change, legislative change, what should we be learning from your experience? What's your advice to us at CCLA um, and to the members of the public who are here today um, because they're interested in this topic and may be interested in seeing what they can do as individuals um, through political engagement or other ways in order to address the risks of this technology? Uh, ben, I'm gonna start with you, please. Well, <coughs> Coming from the United States, I don't advise any country on private sector privacy laws <laughs> because we basically don't have them, um, except in certain sectors for medical records, for education records. We don't have uh, any baseline <coughs> consumer privacy law in the U.S. at all, uh, in part because the sort of dominant data collection companies are very powerful political actors in the U.S., but also in part because we have a Supreme Court that has very broadly interpreted the Constitution to make private sector regulation um, quite difficult. Um, uh, so our, our focus uh, is on the government and law enforcement side. And the principle that we have tried to convey, uh, both to the public and the courts, um, is that 
we need law to play a role that we didn't need in the past. Uh, in the past, our privacy was protected more by cost than it was by law. There simply wasn't an efficient way for governments to keep track of most of us or even many of us. And if they wanted to know where we were, they might have to have teams of agents following us around. They certainly didn't have any technologies like the ones we're talking about right now. And so it was a resource question for them. Um, and that acted as a very powerful limitation. And when we're in a world now where it's technologically and financially feasible for governments to collect and store records of all of our movements, communications, um, uh, we need law to, to do something that we didn't need before. We need law to create that friction that used to be created by cost. Uh, usually that means interposing some kind of warrant requirement, making sure that there is a neutral magistrate in between um, a decision by an agent to pursue us and the collection of that data. That doesn't always map perfectly onto these technologies, but what you want to be doing with law and policy is actually creating inefficiency. Creating inefficiency. Uh, that when we're talking about the exercise of state power, inefficiency is a feature and not a bug. Um, and we need to find ways to, if we're going to use these technologies, slow them down. Um, uh, dramatically. And I think with the public, um, uh, you know, obviously everyone who works on privacy and surveillance has the same complaint. Uh, how do you convince people that this is an urgent issue that affects them? Now we walk by in the U.S., certainly in cities, we walk by surveillance cameras dozens of times a day. We have learned not to worry about that very much. And there's something rational, rational about our not worrying about it because in almost every instance, no one will ever look at that footage. But that's the way things were. That's not the way things will be because pretty soon those cameras are going to be fitted with AI capabilities, with detection mechanisms that are looking for suspicious behavior and that will send an alert to someone. Um, when they also have facial recognition, they'll send not just an alert but an identity. Um, so that thing that you walk by every day uh, imagine that being a person looking at you, and it's going to change the way it feels to move around in our society. If you can convey that, um, uh, the security technologist Bruce Schneier likes to say, think about how you feel when you're driving and a police car pulls up right next to you. Now think about how you would feel if it were that way all the time. Uh, and we have to kind of train ourselves to feel that way all the time. And if we don't want to feel that way all the time, then to use law and policy to, to prevent us from having to live under that kind of regime. Manuel, what's your advice for Canada? Well, I really don't think we, we could have an advice for you because I think with all the problems that maybe you have here, I'm sure the, the, the oversight structure you have is better than ours. I think that the, the, the standard for accessing information is better than, than ours. What our experience would say is that um, implementation chaos and lack of oversight make good grounds for strategic litigation. But of course, that's not enough. Uh, because there's another point we want to, we all here want to raise uh, regarding technology itself. And so there's the problem, how can we access the information to, to do that? So, uh, but I think uh, Gail uh, talked about three points that were very interesting. I would like to add a four point maybe, or I am asking myself if we, if we should think of a four point. Uh, I was listening what Ben was saying about Clearview and he emphasized that he, a couple of times he said it's a startup company, it's a new company uh, that did not recognize some limits that big corporations maybe had. So that means that the very dynamic of the, the business, the security and the technological business is pushing the limits. And that there are serious uh, economic incentives for these enterprises to cross all limits. So I was, I was thinking maybe we should reach out to corporations too, not only work with the, the legal and the political system, but find a way to reach out to corporations too, to talk about this. I don't know. I'm asking myself after hearing what is being said today here.
Gil, did you have anything to add to your advice in addition to your three points that we should be thinking about? I don't think I can, can advise Canada. We hope, I came here hoping to learn from you, actually. <laughs> but uh, I think that what, what we need to think about all the time is that we cannot just um, talk with the court or talk with the officials in the government. We also need to talk with the, with the public. And we also need to try to figure a way to uh, make the public understand the threats of these technologies. And I think all of our organization are struggling with this because the idea of privacy is always something that it's difficult to make people understand un until they don't have any more privacy. It's not something that it's very clear to people when they don't understand what can happen to them until it happens. And so maybe we should not only talk about privacy. Maybe we should talk about the, the, the civil space, the democratic space. We should talk about how we actually want to be living. What is, what's going to be our lifestyle in the future when these technologies are part of our life? Um, are we feeling comfortable to go to a demonstration when we know that, all, that our name will be on a list somewhere easily? Are we feel comfortable to go to a gay bar if we know that this can be recorded somewhere? And this is, I think, that the, or, or, or do we, are we feeling comfortable in, um, in a situation where a technological indication can get us arrested? I mean, it's not just about privacy, it's about how we feel in this, in this kind of, uh, of, of a world, a 1984 kind of, uh, of a world that everything can be, and everyone can be identified and uh, it can be recorded somewhere and somebody can use it. And I think that when you're talking to, to the public about uh, these feelings, maybe they, they might be more listening to, to your calls. Strongly, we sometimes say, if you wouldn't want someone standing at the corner taking your fingerprint to let you cross the street, or why are you okay with a camera essentially taking the, the print of your face in that same situation? And I think those kind of examples that bring it home um, are helpful. The police car right beside you is another great one. Um, but taking it beyond privacy, taking it to what kind of world do we want to live in? is such an important point to be made, so thank you. I wanted to give, on this International Women's Day, the last word to our um, the other woman on the panel. Um, but first, I just want to remind our audience that after the end of this um, response, we will be turning to questions. So if you have questions that you'd like to enter into the Q&A, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, with that, Emmanuel, what's your advice for us? lovely way to introduce the end um, and now I am under a lot of pressure uh, to do all the women proud um, <laughs> but I did actually want to pick up on something Ben said which was about slowing things down um, and there's a reflection from the Bridges case that I think is a really good example of slowing things down uh, and that was around the fifth one of the fifth ground uh, in the court case which we were successful in was that so the police and public bodies in the UK have a positive duty to have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination. Now that's obviously like often used as a tick box exercise. Uh, it's just a due regard. They don't need to actually eliminate it. But in the instance of Bridges, this became incredibly crucial. So in the case, uh, what we argued was that uh, the police did not 
satisfy themselves that they had adhered to this legislation because, as the Court, the court of Appeal said, they never sought to satisfy themselves either directly or by way of independent verification that the software program does not have an unacceptable bias on the grounds of race or sex. So to just explain what that means, the court agreed that uh, because the police had never actually looked at the, the technology and, see, and tried to figure out whether it would be racist uh, and sexist, um, they therefore were not... Uh, they were not in adherence to their duty to try and have due regard to this fact. Um, so this is relevant insofar as basically what the court is saying is that when police are deploying facial recognition, they can't simply rely on the manufacturer's kind of statement of, oh, it's really accurate and oh, don't worry about whether it's racist or sexist or whatever. The police have to actually figure that, like, do that like certify that themselves so that's a good example of like slowing things down because to do that is will take a long time and you know is costly and so on um but that also really leads me on to my second point which is uh that and it's kind of a nice contrast because i think the slowing down is is in a, in a way like a short-term uh way of trying to fight against this technology but i think we also really have to be playing the long game and the long game is the really nuanced conversation that we all need to be having uh to upskill the public and ourselves about the issue of racial injustice because you know as we've discussed uh this is this technology is being used in particular ways to oppress marginalized communities and i should say not just racial injustice but injustice in, in you know in in different in all forms oppressive in the kind of wider sense and that for you know in the in the case of police is that it will always be deployed to oppress and harm the most marginalized people and obviously that's different to the bias arguments that i referred to in the first example um and so i think you know for liberty, not only are we working against facial recognition, but we're also working on a big longer term campaign that is really attempting to get to the heart of encouraging the public, encouraging everyone to think more critically about how we conceive of crime um, and, and that we have to deal with the root causes before we jump to allegedly sophisticated and technological quick fixes. So, you know, this tech is expensive and we're asking, you know, what would it look like if we invested that money? into communities and obviously that's helpful because parliamentarians will always say you know how can we afford to you know make our schools better or you know house homeless people well you know we can use facial recognition as the example of well why don't you just ban facial recognition let's use that money to actually respond to the social issues that the police are justifying their use of facial recognition to police control communities in the first place. So that's obviously a really long term, long, you know, long strategy, but I think we need to have really creative strategies that do work on the kind of short, immediate term. So legal cases, strategic litigation, but also really try and win on those really public political conversations. Large scale systemic societal change seems like a great turning point. <laughs> Um, for us to then um, address some of the questions that are starting to come in from our audience. Um, I think for reasons of time and also to get through as many audience questions as possible, I will read the question um, and then I'll ask the panel to volunteer if they're interested in responding to that particular question. And we'll perhaps just have one or at the most two panelists for each question to make sure that as many audience members as possible have their questions answered. Um, the first question um, from one of our participants, um, he or she states, today it's facial recognition, tomorrow it's my voice or gait. Facial recognition is one of several um, ways um, that um, the this, this skeleton that creates a prop, the skeleton, which is the problem, but ultimately the skeleton itself is the problem. It's a problem with the system that allows companies to commodify our biometric information and use it for their own purposes. Um, what's the panel's response to that overall concern? Any takers? Um, 
I know that you've done some work in terms of other kinds of biometrics, and I think this questioner is asking about, you know, raising the issue that it's not just about faces, because there are other ways in which our bodies can be used to identify us or, or work against us in these contexts. Um, so have you got any comments yeah. on that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about oh. my mic. Um, well, the other questions are because that was already such a good question and like yeah it, there's gonna be, i know there's gonna be so many amazing ones um but i think this is a really good example actually of and also just kind of referencing the, the context in canada that brenda mentioned which is that there's an opportunity to uh potentially win some things around privacy and so on uh and i think yeah this this question is is, is so important because it identifies that exactly as, as the question started with, it's facial recognition today, but like, what is it tomorrow? And I think one lesson from the challenge of trying to fight facial recognition is that it has happened at such a fast pace and we've all been trying to catch up with it that I think what we really need to do is, is to get, on, get in front of uh, the many different types of forms and future kind of ten technical innovations that that are coming down the line um and I, I think of course you know we can't always presume to know what that technology might look like it's it's you know it's as as we say it's like very innovative um and things are happening at a very fast pace but I think there is a way certainly uh to try and stop it by kind of legislating for really broad bans so saying biometric technology should never be used by the police, for example, would be able to capture not just facial recognition, but also gate recognition and um, yeah, other forms of biometric surveillance, essentially. So I hope that starts to answer the question, but yeah, it's a great question. To do another question from our online audience, but I would also like to extend the opportunity to my Inclo colleagues who are sitting in the room um, that if you have questions, put up your hand and we will have somebody run a microphone to you. Um, so the next question um, from our online participants, what can we, the public, do to protect ourselves from the archiving of our faces by governments or corporations? For example, while going through the airport here at Pearson in Toronto, I was forced to use the automatic customs machine to get back into Canada. The machine then scanned my face. I can only imagine this image is now kept in some archive along with other past scans of my face. So what can we do as members of the public um, to push back against the collection of our faces for state purposes? You can donate money to the Canadian Civil Liberties <laughs> Union. That's, I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> But um, I think that in, uh, I think one of the things that we should try to do is to um, expand the, the knowledge of people of the risk of giving voluntarily their biometric data to corporations. We saw that in Israel during the, the COVID, uh, where um, facial recognition high-tech companies were viewing the situation as a very nice opportunity to advance their, pro their product. So one example was that they started to sell it to uh, uh, football stadiums and uh, theaters or large crowd uh, facilities um, saying, okay, if, if you want people uh, to come quickly without spending a lot of time um, that you will need to check if they have the green passport or if they were uh, vaccinated uh, when those restrictions were, were during COVID, then we can give you a, a biometric system. People will uh, identify themselves and when they arrive to the stadium, they will stand in front of our camera and camera will say that this person is free to go in. You don't need to check him again. He's already uploaded his uh, green passport or certificate to our website. 
And a lot of people said, oh, good, I can skip the line. I don't need to wait in lines. And they didn't understand that what they are doing is giving their biometric data to some uh, company that nobody knows what they are going to do with this photo bank, recognize photo bank in the future. Uh, nobody reads the restrictions in their uh, privacy policy, which usually say that they will not use it, but in the future they may use it some, some yes. Or nobody's thinking about uh, a lot of cases that we saw recently of uh, these photo banks are being uh, stolen from this company or there was some failure in protecting them. And if you lose your, your credit card or somebody steals your credit card, you can change credit card. But if your uh, biometric data is in the hands of some corporation, you can change your, uh, your biometric data. This is something that is unchangeable. So people should be really aware of the risk and we should try to explain to people that uh, even though it's kind of legal to give it voluntarily, just don't do that or and, and, and be aware of, of the risk of giving your biometric uh, data to somebody. Don't see any hands in the room. The offer is still out there, people. Uh, the next question from an online participant, uh, would it be fair, or sorry, of course facial recognition technology should bother us from a privacy and civil liberties viewpoint, but is there anything good about it? Can we think of any way facial recognition could be used to protect or reinforce our freedoms? Ben's got his hand out. Well, sure. I mean, most technologies have beneficial uses. Um, I don't want to see a surveillance drone flying over my neighborhood. Um, but I might want to see it flying over a war zone and recording human rights violations. I might want to see a news organization fly one over a violent encounter between the police and protesters uh, and to record that. Similarly with facial recognition, it could be used to identify a war criminal. It could be used to identify a child victim of a grotesque crime. We shouldn't pretend that these technologies don't have use cases that we wouldn't applaud. Um, of course, that's really true of government power in a lot of other iterations. Um, a lot more crimes would be stopped if we uh, allowed, as the city of Baltimore and the United States tried, to fly a spy plane over the city all day and really record everything in granular detail and record that for months so that it could be rewound by the police to solve crimes that happen. But do you want to live under a spy plane um, where every time you walk down the street holding hands with somebody, that is going to be in a surveillance time machine that can be rewound later on? Yes, more crimes are going to be solved, but it's going to change um, what it feels like to live in our societies. And that's what makes these argument so difficult and it's why putting constraints on facial recognition is going to be so difficult because uh, I think candidly here the government's got caught a little bit flat-footed. I think they expected people to be um, enthusiastic uh, about their use and I think um, they're going to organize more and they're going to try to identify uh, more and more cases where it was used and you saw Clearview AI very ghoulishly stepped into the Russia-Ukraine war said, well, we'll um, identify the corpses of Russian soldiers so their mothers won't have to be in doubt, about, right? So, so they're just trying to find ways where we'll think, oh, these people are on our side. Um, but, but again, it doesn't help us to ignore that there are uses of these technologies um, that, um, you know, that can be helpful and beneficial. Yeah, which is why it's so important, as, I, as you said earlier, to think about if these technologies should be used, and if, then when and how. Um, but that if question needs to be at the forefront. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, would it be fair to say that as such programs effectiveness or usefulness evolves, democracy itself as we define it is directly and peripherally undermined, regardless of a nation's governance status? That's an awesome question. Anybody want to take a stab? You're nodding, Manuel. 
Oh, well, I will just say that yes, it's fair to say that. <laughs> I think Gail made a, a, a very clear point about that when he argued that it's not like only a, a privacy issue, it's a broader issue and we have to, to address it in, in all its, its complexity and I think it, it does like feedback loops with other problems which affect democracy too. So I think uh, definitely yes, we, we could say and we should say that it's uh, a threat to democracy. I apologize to all those questioners whose questions we can't get to, but we are running very close to the end of time for this panel. And we do appreciate that an hour and a half on a Zoom call is probably more than long enough for many of you who are likely ready to log off and go for dinner. Um, so I just want to conclude by thanking our panelists. Thank you, Manuel and Ben and Gil and Emmanuel uh, for sharing your insights and your experience and your advice um, and your stories with us. Because one way that we come together to fight incursions into rights is by sharing stories that help us understand what's at stake. So we're so grateful that you are willing to share your stories with us today. Um, I'd like to Thank, on behalf of CCLA, the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, for supporting this panel, uh, for bringing everyone together, for, and allowing us to have these conversations. With special thanks to those individuals, and you know who you are, who did all of the behind-the-scenes work to make this happen. I think that all of us here at the table, many others at INCLO, um, are committed to carrying forward work to stand up for rights and freedoms and civil liberties, and to serve as some of the identifiable faces of resistance to the potential for mass surveillance, to serve as experts in policy circles and settings, to advocate against invasive uses of FRT here in Canada, to have nuanced conversations around those if and when questions. Um, and we invite those of you in the audience today to share that work with us, whether it's through political engagement, whether it's through individual action, whether it's just through, as, as Gil so articulately explained, simply continuing to learn more about this and other risky technologies and make choices, make conscious decisions about whether or not you are or are not willing to participate in those systems, um, particularly those that are risky, um, that impact our privacy rights and all of the other suite of rights that privacy enables. Um, with that, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.